us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Amen. Lord, help me. I want to talk to you uh, about making, having content and making connections. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for your goodness and your love. Thank you for this wonderful, beautiful Lord's Day that we can come into your house. And God, we pray today that the Spirit of the Lord would be here and make up the difference between what man can do and what you can do. Let no flesh glory in your sight. and Let the Word of God go forth clearly and plainly. And let it be received in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> well, Brother Wells told me this morning, he said, I, I'm just hoping that y'all bring some of that camp meeting back. And uh, I tell you what, it was fabulous. Um, and um, I had no idea what I would preach about. You know, in a camp meeting... Uh, and let me, let me tell you something about camp meetings. Camp meetings are wonderful because you get the best of the best. Amen. Uh, preachers preach messages that is burning in them that they've most often preached before, many times possibly. Um, um, and so you get, you get their best. And uh, I'll tell you what, that makes it good. Because a uh, pastor in a church, sometimes you, 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 know, you can't cook the, th the same thing ever, over and over and over. Uh, you folks will get bored. So, I, and I have never been one. I don't think, I may have once, literally, I tell you this honestly, I may have once in the last 20 years preached a message two times. I don't preach reruns. Um, and it's not, it's not because I, I, it's not because they're not good, um, but uh, Pastor in a church is a little different because you know you folks are going to look at my ugly mug every week. You know you got to, uh, I got to try to have something fresh for you. Um, but anyway, I was uh, in the camp meeting and I had no idea what I was going to be preaching about. And Brother Bearclaw preached a message uh, about winning souls, and and his burden uh, was so evident. Brother Bearclaw is a he's done lots of missions work, and he was just in India. Uh, where uh, he went to a went to a school there, where literally he said he got up early, and um, he went, and it was so so hot, but those students were crying out to God early in the morning, and they were they I mean he said they were praying and they were getting with it. I mean they were moaning and travailing before the Lord, and he asked the leader of the school um, about those kids and all, and and. Um, all of those kids that went to that school would go out to not uh, take over established churches, but to, to start churches. And uh, the, the, the leader of that school told him that over 50% of those kids would get, get, get uh, they would have to give their lives for the gospel within five years. One out of two would die because of their faith in Jesus Christ. That so moved me um, because, uh, anyway, so Brother Bearclaw preached and then uh, a gentleman right after him preached a phenomenal message and about uh, God uh, given line by line and various messages and, and um, I, I got to thinking, uh, my wife and I talked about it the night before. She said, what do you think it is about uh, preachers that some of them, uh, they all have good things to say, but some of them you make it more of a connection with. And, um, and uh, when she said that, it, it really turned a light on, and I began to think about that. And so I, I, I saw something that I had never seen before. I'd seen it in principle, but never, never really, it never really came clear. But... Um, I think the key is to both have content and make a connection. 
And uh, so it's with that this morning that I want to talk to you about. Uh, go with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 7 and verse 9. Romans 7 and 9. Uh, Caleb will put it up there if you, don't, if you can't find it uh, quickly. But um, the Bible says... For, um, and this is Paul talking here, he said, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained of, of life I found to be unto death. For sin taketh occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Our text verse said, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Paul here explains more about how that happens. He said, I was alive without the law once. But uh, when the law came, sin revived, and I died. Meaning that um, before truth came my way, I was comfortable in my sin. I didn't know I was doing wrong. You ever wonder how some folks can just uh, do things wrong and, 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 and there's no seeming, their conscience doesn't bother them. They have no, they have no remorse over, over uh, lying, cussing, blaspheming, lusting. They just, they're, they're, they're free to seem like they're, they're just happy doing it. And uh, you, you would think, you'd look into that and you say, they got to know that that's wrong. But the reality it is, sin, uh, the law has not come yet. And so they're alive in their sins. Now, if they die in their sins, they'll go to hell. But they have no conscience. They have no con con uh, conviction in their lives. And so they're just happy to do what their impulses and their fleshly man tells them to do. But once the law came, sin revived and I died. Now I can't be happy in my sin anymore. I can't be comfortable doing that because I know it's in, I'm in violation to what God wants in my life. And so I'm uh, now dying this death. I can't, I can't be happy. I can't enjoy sin like I used to could. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do for me what it once did. and it, It's empty now. And so the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. You know, Jesus said, He said, uh, it's needful for you that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Comforter won't come. But if I go away, He'll send us another Comforter, the sweet Holy Ghost of God to dwell in us. And that Spirit quickens us. I'll never forget Mark Hudson preaching one time on a shock treatment. And uh, he told a story that his cousin used to drive an ambulance and he went with him one night uh, to a call and, and it was a, a bad accident and the guy, they got there and the guy was flatlined and they got the defibrillators out and uh, they shocked that man. And uh, he come back because of the shock. Uh, the, the scripture tells us that the spirit quickeneth us. He, he gives us a shock. You ever seen somebody get to worship of the Lord and, and start jerking? You ever seen that happen? That's the Holy Ghost uh, quickening us. Amen. The Spirit of God gets inside and He quickens us to life. And so uh, the letter versus the Spirit. John 6 and 63 uh, further talks about this. It says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh, profiteth nothing. The Spirit quickens, but the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, what makes preaching different than just public speaking? What makes a man of God, when he gets into the word of God and starts talking about the things of God, what is different about that speech than someone talking about business or, or whatever? Because we're not talking about fleshly things. We're talking about spiritual things. Amen? The spirit, the spirit quickeneth, but the flesh profiteth nothing. And he said, I speak unto you that they that are spirit and they that are life. 
And in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, and, and, and I'm fixing to get to something here. I'm, I'm laying a foundation for us, but uh, you've you got to get this this morning. I'll tell you what, this is going to help, help, help us if we get it. I'm going to bring this water down here. Um, and uh, I need to tell somebody here, hey, listen, are you planning on going to heaven? How many of you plan on going to heaven? Have you made preparations to go to heaven? Are you committed to going to heaven? Amen. Uh, not everybody's going. You know that, right? Uh, it reminds me, and I was thinking about this this morning, it reminds me of a story Brother Bloom and I was talking about. Uh, Jerry Clower was talking about Marcel Ledbetter. Marcel had a, uh, he had this dog, uh, and this dog was a good-looking dog, and his, his uncle lived up in Chicago, and he called Marcel, and he said, Marcel, he said, they're having a dog show up here. And he said, if you get on a plane and fly that dog up here, he said, I know that dog will win. He said, he ain't got to be talented, he just got to look good. And he said, I know your dog would win this. He said, I ain't never been on a plane and I'm scared. And he said, well, he said, you can do it. Get that dog and get to the airport and get on up here to Chicago and win this dog show. So Marcel, got, he got his dog and his Bible. And he went and got on that plane and uh, he sat down, he had his Bible, he opened it up. And uh, this guy sitting across from me, he said, oh, no. He said, you mean to tell me I'm sitting here beside a Bible thumper? He said, are you a Bible thumper? He said, well, I ain't no Bible thumper. He said, but I believe every word in it, and I'm going to read it. And he said, you mean to tell me you believe that story in there about Jonah getting swallowed by that big fish and being in the belly of that big fish for three days? He said, if it's in the Bible, I believe every word of it. And that settles it. The guy said to him, he said, well, what, if, what if you get to heaven and Jonah even, ain't even there in heaven? He thought for a minute, he said, well, if I get to heaven and Jonah ain't there, he said, I guess you can ask him about it. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody's going, are they? <laughs> Ephesians 4 and 15. That was just a little side note there. The Bible says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. You know when you can know you've grown up? You know when you can know you've matured? You know, you, you know when you know that you've got some spiritual maturity about you? It's when you can start speaking the truth in love. Amen. So let's dive into it. Truth and love. Content and connection. I'm going to say, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to give you what the Lord gave me this morning. So I just want you to turn your listeners on. Seeking to communicate a truth is a great thing. All preachers get into the ministry because they have a desire to communicate truth. The truth resonated one day in their own hearts and they realize that they need to share that truth. But listen, if your desire to deliver truth is to impress, to oppress, or to control the result will not please God. If your desire to communicate truth is for the purpose to impress, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard preachers, man, they, they, they had some insight. And they, they just, man, they could deliver it, and it was impressive. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if the preacher's desire is to impress. And then I've seen some folks that they had truth like a whip because they wanted to keep people oppressed. They wanted to beat people into submission with the truth. Bless God, it says it right there in the book, and if you don't line up right now, you're going to hell. Hallelujah. Praise God. I've, I've seen a lot of that. To either impress or oppress or to control. 
If that's your motive in sharing truth, I promise you the result will not be pleasing to God. God is not pleased when we use truth as a whipping post for people. Can somebody say amen? People who desire to tell the truth at the expense expense of loving people is more often not motivated, is more often not motivated, or is motivated by self-righteousness and judgment, a judgmental spirit which is repulsive to God. People who desire to tell the truth to people to both expose them, control them, and they tell the truth at the expense of loving people. In other words, God didn't call me to like you. God didn't call me, you know, to be friends with you. God told me to tell you the truth. If that is the motive, that is more often coming from a self-righteous, judgmental spirit, and it brings a result that does not please God. Now, I said, number one, seeking a desire, seeking a desire to communicate truth is a good thing. Now, to have a desire to make a connection is equally good. I want to connect with people. I want want to make a connection with people. The reason I get down from up there and I come out here and I I touch you, the reason I try to uh, tell humorous stories, the reason that I try to get vulnerable myself and, and tell you about my weaknesses is because I'm striving to make a connection with you. And um, I think Jeremiah demonstrates this well. He got so frustrated with the people he preached to. He got aggravated at them. The Bible said they wagged their heads at him. In other words, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Making fun of him right while he's talking to them. He got so aggravated. He got so aggravated, he said, I ain't saying another word to them. You know, the Apostle Paul said the same thing. He said, if I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. Jeremiah said, I ain't saying another word to you. But then just a couple verses later, the Bible said he was weary with forbearing and he could not stay because the fire burned within him. You know what that meant? He loved them and he knew that what he had to say would help them. And even though they didn't want it, even though they didn't like it, his love motivated him. It burned within him. And I've heard people say, well, you know, the, the, the Word of God burned within him. And it was the Word of God that he knew that that's what they needed. But, but because he loved them, he, he, he could not keep himself from reaching from the, for them. Listen to this. If you desire to connect and love people, if your desire to connect and love people is not grounded in truth, the result will not please God. Because people who desire to make a connection and have friendships at the expense of truth is more often motivated by a fear of rejection and not a desire to please God. So here's the thing. We should love truth and we should love people. Amen. And we should know that the truth of God's Word is the answer for people. And if we really love people and we really love God, we cannot help but try to let truth and love reign supreme in our lives. Whenever one is left out, damage is done. Now, let's talk about content. Let's talk about content or truth. I would say this, content is what I know to be true. The only real substantive thing in your life is what you know to be true. I would go so far as to say what you know is more important than how you feel. Can somebody say amen? How many of you know that feeling is an unstable thing in our lives? Sometimes we feel like we're in love with our spouse. Sometimes we don't feel like we're in love with our spouse. Sister Liana, does Wes always make you feel love? Don't answer the question. (laughs) Don't answer the question. I don't want to cause you to lie here in church. 
what I know is more important than how I feel many times. <clears throat> I, I love what Brother Charlie Jordan used to say. He said, there's a big difference in, in Christianity from those that are up and down and those that are in and out. Big difference between people that are up and down and people that are in and out. But he said something, that, and I don't, I, I don't know that it was original with him. Uh, maybe it was. But he said, but here's the thing. People that are always up and down will eventually be in and out. That's good, isn't it? So while it is more important what you know than what you feel, your feelings and your knower ought to meet a little more often. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Your feelings and your knower ought to meet a little more often. Amen. Do you know you're saved this morning? Amen. Amen. You ought to put your mind on that a little more until your feelings can get caught up with your knower. Amen. Amen. Do you know you're forgiven this morning? Do you know you're going to heaven this morning? Well, we ought to lift our hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you. Praise God. Hallelujah for that. Amen. Amen. Because our feelers and our knowers ought to get they ought to get a little more in line. Now, content. Content. What I know to be true. Truth is necessary in order to help anybody. Now, I'm, 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 I'm going to tell you something this morning that's going to help you. I, I promise you it's going to help you. Hey, Hosea said this. He said in 4 and 6, he said, my, my, God said, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. And I will also forget thee. You can't help anybody without truth. You can't help anybody without having content. In John 8 and 31, the Bible says, Then said Jesus unto those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You cannot bring freedom to people without the content of truth being delivered to people. You ain't going to help people just by chumming up to them and say, oh, brother, I feel so sorry for you. And God, oh, I, f- I feel bad for you. Here, let me give you some money. Here, let me help you and do this and do that. You, you're not going to bring deliverance and freedom to people without the content of truth given to people. Can you say amen? And oh, I tell you what, we need to lovingly Give the truth to people. Because if the truth is not a part of the equation, there will eventually be no help. You can give and give and give, and it'll just be taken and received and received, but no change will be brought without truth being injected into the mix. Content is absolutely essential for a good result to come. Now, Brother, Brother Frank, it'd be wonderful if I got cancer, I would love to go to a doctor that had great bedside manner and was compassionate and showed tenderness. That would, that would just be, that'd be wonderful. But if he don't know beans about treating cancer, then don't give me that doctor. Amen. I, at that moment, what I need is somebody who knows how to go get it and get it out of me. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. And and so uh, to to take truth out of the equation and to take content away, uh, you leave people hurting. They may feel good for a moment that, oh, they were so nice and they they made me feel so good and they they seem to be so compassionate and they seem to have empathy and, and, and I just feel better. You may feel better for a moment, but I tell you what, if you don't have content, you're not going to bring deliverance to people. That's good right there. That's good. To have feelings of love and compassion for people without being truthful helps no one. Who was it Martin Luther King said, Martin Luther King Jr., that he had a dream of the day that would come that a man could be judged on the content of his character and not the color of his skin? Hey, the content of one's character 
the content of one's character is the foundation of his life. Amen. Compassion without content will ultimately produce contempt. Now let me explain that to you because I know that, 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 that doesn't make sense right at, right at first. We live in a child-centered parenting culture. And so these kids, these kids that are raising kids today, they, uh, they think that it's their job to be friends with their kids. Their, friend, their kids don't need a friend, they need a parent. The time will come that you can be friends. But what your child needs is a parent. But because their parents were strict and harsh, they grew up and said, I'm not going to treat my kids that way and I'm not going to discipline my kids and I'm not going to spank my kids and I'm going to just show compassion to my children. Well, we've raised some kids like that now and you know what happens? Almost without fail, those kids grow up and turn around and despise and have contempt for their parents because they've lied to them. The world don't revolve around me. You told me it did. I got out here in the real world and they didn't like me. You lied to me. Or if you really loved me, you would have given me that car. If you really loved me, you would help me pay my rent. If you loved me, you would do this. There's contempt. Because compassion without content, without truth, without discipline, without substance, compassion alone will ultimately produce contempt. The most contemptuous people I know is the people that's on the, on the government dole. The most ungrateful, bitter people are those that's getting handouts regularly. I might need to turn around. Amen, Brother Gary, that's good preaching. Because compassion without content produces contempt. What they need is a job. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. What they need is responsibility. The Bible says it is good for a young man to bear the yoke in his youth. Yes. Yes. Amen. That means you don't wait till they're 20 years old to give them any responsibility. Amen. You give them responsibility early because it helps them to know that the world ain't just going to give them everything. And you didn't lie to them. Hallelujah. Amen. And then, you, then when life beats them up, then you can show compassion. But you've not built a, a wrong foundation in their, in their, in their view of the life, life in the world. Hey, it bothers me today of these preachers and ministries that telling people, oh, come to Jesus and He'll fix all your problems. Come to Jesus and He'll make everything that's bad in your life go away. Come to Jesus and you'll get happy. Hey, listen, brothers. Hey, and the Bible said they that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. God never promised you it would be an easy road. He never promised you that everything would be, you know, happy and, and, and roses and, and lovely. He did promise you he'd go with you to the end of the world. He'd go through it with you. Amen. But content and compassion, content and connection, there has to be both. And if you take content out of the equation, it will lead to contempt. Boy, that's good. Now let's look at connection. Connection is love. Connection, reaching for people in love. Love and compassion. If truth is not delivered with the wrappings of love, the gift will most likely be discarded and mistaken for trash. Let me say that again. That's good. The Lord just gave it to me. That's good. If truth is not delivered in the wrappings of love, the gift will most likely be mistaken for trash and be discarded. You wonder why, thank you, Brother Dave. You wonder why these women, they go and get these real fancy little baskets and they're going to give somebody a gift and they're going to give them a, a book. 
My wife does that. She's going to give somebody a book, and she'll go get this pretty little bag, and she'll put this flowery stuff all on it, you know, and this, you know, ribbons and stuff. And, and I'm thinking, honey, the content is the book. Who cares about the wrappings? Do you know why? Because when nobody needs to make a mistake that something good's inside. Nobody needs to throw this away. If you just found that old book, you would think, well, I don't know what's in that book. I'd, I'd, I'd throw it in the trash. But because the wrappings, it spoke of the content that was in it. And brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. This old world, amen, as wicked as they are, as hateful they are, Hey Amen. The, the people of God need to be so clothed with the love of God that when we speak the truth to people that they can sense the love and the wrappings of what we're saying. Amen. It wants them to open up the present. It wants them to look inside. It wants them to... Ta- hey, we ain't going to throw this away. Amen. Amen. To, to make a connection. I said before, amen, you must have content. It ain't going to help nobody if you don't have content. But listen, equally as so, I mean, if all you got is truth and you don't have, if you don't have a connection with people, if you don't wrap it in love, I mean, they're going to throw it away and reject it and it will do nothing for people. Well, I thought that would really excite somebody right there. I thought that'd make you get up and want to shout right there. Truth without love will produce rebellion. Truth without love will produce rebellion. I remember hearing a story years and years ago when I was, actually, I think I might have still been in school, but uh, went to, I believe it was an AC um, convention or something. Uh, No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was when we had the Christian school here the very first time. We went to Denver to uh, an ACE deal, and um, we was in a conference there. And I'll never forget, this one speaker got up, and he uh, he was asking question, had question and answer, and talking about uh, somebody asked, "How do you discipline, uh, you know, kids?" And and this, that, and the other. How many of you guys were raised in an era of time where you still got paddles paddling at school? Raise your hand. You didn't. Uh, many of you did. I did. I'll never forget. Boy, I had bend over, and principal had a paddle, and he had drilled holes in it. And the rule was at our house. If you got one at, at the school, you got one at home. And uh, I mean, I, I grew up. I grew up in that in that in that world. That was the world I grew up in. And uh, and this was you know, thirty years ago, twenty twenty eight years ago when this was happening. This conference I went to, and a guy asked me, "How do you discipline a child uh, today?" Because there was already starting to be some resistance from parents. No, I don't want you to discipline my kid. I'll do that at home and this, that, and the other. And how do you discipline a child in corporal punishment? And I'll never forget what that man said. It, 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 changed, it changed my life. I mean, it, it really did. And I didn't, have, I didn't have big kids at the time. I, mean, I think Josh might have been just a little bitty toddler at the time. He said, this is what we do at our school. He said, I do not allow my principal to administer corporal punishment if he is not committed to spending at least four hours with that child after the discipline is over. To take that child to a park, take him to it with a picnic, take him to his home. He, he must be willing to show love to that child in order to have the right to administer discipline. That's potent right there. You want, to know, you want to know why kids that are disciplined without love grow up and rebel? Because it's nothing more than big people beating up on little people. Amen. And while I said it to you, it is equally as bad for a parent to just say, I love you, I love you, I love you. Those kids are going to grow up and hate you. But it's also bad, equally as bad, if all you do is discipline and you don't show love, you can show the right. You can have the right teaching. You can have the right rules in your house. You can have the right. You can have it all by the letter. This is this is what we're doing. Bless God, we're going to do it like this. But if you don't have love, you're a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. You're an annoyance. Amen. Amen. Spreading the gospel, sharing the love of Christ 
It's dirty business sometimes. I was telling, I was showing Charles last Sunday. I was showing him my fingernails. I, I used to have, I always had calloused hands because I've, I've worked. But when I get around trucks and vehicles, grease, literally, I'm convinced it just jumps off the thing onto me. I don't know what it is. I, I, I can't stay clean. My dad can change oil in his suit and never get a drop on him. I get up within five feet. I, I was changing oil in my truck the other day, and I come in, and I had a shirt that I had on, and it was just black polka dotted. My face was black polka dotted, and I, and I was just, I was black all over. Not your kind of black, Sister Tracy. But you know what? The world that I have been uh, introduced to now, you have to get your hands dirty. You have to get down in, in the grease. You have to do that. And dealing with people is sometimes dirty business. Sometimes it's, it's not comfortable. I have been in bus kids' is, is houses, literally, I, had to, I, I couldn't hardly breathe. It stunk so bad. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is John 1, 14. The Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. How much of a downgrade do you think it was for Jesus to leave the splendor of heaven and come and walk dusty roads They didn't have air conditions when Jesus' day. You think it might have stunk? You think that when we went by the Sea of Galilee, them dead fish out there, do you think it might have had an odor? Amen. You know why he did that? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. God's just and He's true and His word is absolute. Amen. And He said, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And we've got to walk right and spit white, folks, if we're going to make heaven. We can't have hidden sins that's unconfessed. We can't be hypocritical. We can't be, we can't be uh, compliant to the world's agenda. We've got to come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord. We've got to be a holy people. And every bit of that is absolutely the gospel truth. But if we do not wrap that message with the love of God, we're not going to do any good for anybody. And if we love people at the expense of telling them that, we ain't going to do no good to nobody. You've got to have both. If you just have love for your children and you don't ever discipline them, you're, you're setting them up for failure. And they will turn around and despise you one day for that. But if you discipline them without loving them and communicating that, then they're going to equally rebel. I thank God that, the, that, that in my home, both being raised and with my children, the discipline process was never completed until there was reuniting of fellowship. We had not completed the process until we had come full circle into where there was that hug. I told you guys about the last whipping I got from my mom, didn't I? I was about 15 years old, and my mom was having a bad day, and I'll never forget we was on the Old England Highway in Arkansas in a 1977 Toyota Corolla. And my mom was griping, and she was just having a horrible day. She was, she was actually gossiping about church people. She was having a bad day. And in my self-righteousness, I looked over to her and I said, Mom, you need to shut up. She didn't say a word. She turned that car straight for home. We got home and she said, lay down on that bed. I was too big for her to handle me like, you know, she used to. She said, lay down. She took that belt and she commenced to beat me. I mean, she whooped the far out of me. I mean... Did you hear? Not the fire, the far. She whooped the far out of me. 
she beat me and beat me, man. And she got done, and she said, get up and hug my neck and tell me you're sorry and that you love me. That was commands. So I gave her one of them, you know, half-hearted hugs. That was not satisfactory. Get back down on the bed. Lay back down. I laid back down, and she commenced to beat me again. I can tell this on her because she ain't here. <laughs> she got done beating me that time. She was bawling. I was bawling. And she said, hug my neck. And boy, that time it was, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Mom. I thank God for that second beating. That first one, I ain't going to cry. I ain't going to let her know that this even hurts. I'm, you know, just, just, I'm going to take this. process wasn't completed until fellowship had been, had been reunited. Listen, brothers and sisters, the reason that I want your spirit open to me this morning is because I got some hard things to say to you and I know that the old flesh ain't going to like it. And if you was just operating on that crown, you, you'd, you'd, you'd get mad at me. But I want you to know that I love you. And I want you to know that I don't want you to go to hell and I don't want you to handle the things of God lightly. And I care about your soul and I'm reaching for you that you dedicate your life to Jesus Christ. Don't go the way of the world. Don't listen to the devil in your life. I know the old flesh don't like to hear that. You need to tune it up. You need to straighten up. You need to, you need to do right. You need to get more dedicated. The old flesh don't like to hear that. But could you see an old rugged cross this morning and God's love reaching out to you so much that He laid down His life for you? Could you see that this morning? I'm over my time. Uh, they, done, they done told me I was, I was past time, but... This is your camp meeting overtime, right? P.S. right here. I'm going to close with this. How do you make a connection? How do you make a connection? Number one, you have to come near to make a connection. You have to get close to make a connection. You ever been walking by and just get your hand close to a light switch and fire jump? And depend upon how the carpet was and how strong it was. I mean, sometimes it'll jolt you pretty good, won't it? Hey, listen, folks. If we're going to have an impact on this world, we've got to get close to them. Oh, Brother Gear, you just told me to come out from among the world. Yeah, come out from their ideology. Come out from their philosophy. But Jesus Christ, He came close to the world. He walked among them. Amen. Matter of fact, you remember that story? He went in, I believe it was Simon's house. He went into Simon's house, and that, that lady came behind him, and she started weeping. She got down on her, on her hands and feet, and she began to weep, and the tears, she began to wash Jesus' feet with the tears, and Simon said, oh, if this man was a real prophet, he'd, he'd know what kind of woman this was. But well, my question is, how did he know what kind of woman she was? He said, oh, if he was really a man of God, he wouldn't allow this woman to be touching him. Jesus not only touched, he allowed others to touch him. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm reaching out to you, dear Lord. I'm reaching out to you. I know that your arm is not too short that you can't reach me too. So as I pray, I'm going to press my way. Just like that woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, she pressed her way and she said, if I could just but touch him, the hem of his garment. If you're going to make a connection, you've got to be willing to get close. Oh, I tell you what, folks. You can't hold people at arm's length. I told my wife, I said, these truckers, man, I consider them some of them my friends. I have, I have come in contact with some foul mouth, vile people that I love dearly. That I love dearly and consider them to be friends. And if the church world's got a problem with that, then you just got a problem. I'm sorry. 
Because that's what Jesus was accused of, to be a friend of sinners. And I would hope that, Brother Charles, you could testify to the fact that I ain't, I'm not hiding my faith and I'm not condoning nobody's sin, but I'm willing to get in there and get my hands dirty. You, get, you ain't going to make a connection with people if you just go and knock on the door. Here, I want to invite you to church. That's it. Boom. Done. On, on. I did my, did my service for Jesus. You've got to be willing to get close. Secondly, you have to be willing to show concern the Bible says in Matthew 9 and 36, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. And thirdly, you have to be moved to action. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 18, that they doing good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute and willing to communicate. Willing to communicate. Willing to communicate. Are you willing to communicate? You know, one of the, you know the biggest lie the devil tells me, Brother Frank? They don't want to hear what you've got to say. He, the devil tells me that constantly. I mean constantly. Just keep your mouth shut. They don't care what you have to say. Uh, you will never know what a struggle it is for me to override that. Willing to communicate. It's tough to be willing to communicate. and then touch and be touched. In Mark 1 and 40, Caleb, put this up there, please. This will be our last scripture, Mark 1 and 40. You won't really know the significance of this until you understand kind of some of the background, but, but it says, And there came a leopard to him, this is to Jesus, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him and saying unto him, If thou wilt, Thou canst make me clean. This leprous man, he had leprosy. And he said, Lord, he knelt down, that showed humility. He said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. That showed faith. And Jesus could have said, He could have said, Be healed. He could have done that. Right? But look at the next verse. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him. And touched him. And touched him. Jesus disobeyed the Mosaic law that said he was to not be touched. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And the verses following, Jesus says, don't, 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 don't tell nobody. But go show yourself to the priest just like Moses law said to do it. You think Jesus knew what he was doing when he touched him? You, you, why do you think Jesus touched him? He could have healed him without touching him. Why, why did Jesus touch him? Think about it. Why was it important for Jesus to touch the man? My wife told me a story. And oh, this is a powerful ending right here. She told me a story that Adolf Hitler back in the, the 40s, late 30s and 40s, around World War II time, he was doing all kinds of freakish studies on people. I mean, the man was obsessed. He was possessed. But he did one study with babies. And he put all these babies in a nursery. And he, he was doing some other tests, trying to figure out. He, you know, he wanted to have blue-eyed, blonde-haired people and all this stuff. But he took all these babies, put them in a nursery. And some of them, it was psychological studies and various things. But anyway, this certain group of babies, I don't know how many there were, but they had every one of their needs met. They had, they had all their the right nourishment. They had everything. But he forbade them 
to hold them or touch them. You know what happened with those babies? Every single one of them died. They died. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that filled my soul. Something wonderful happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Let's sing it together. Oh, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that fills my soul. Something happened. And now I know he touched me and made me whole. If you've never felt the touch of God, I beg you to reach out to him because he's reaching out to you. And he'll touch you. And when he touches you, you will not be the same. You will not be the same because He touched you. Amen. I needed content. I needed truth. I wasn't going to get no help without it. But thank God God just didn't throw up truth on me. Thank God He didn't just tell me what I needed to do. He was willing to get down in the dirt with me and walk those dusty roads. And he said, oh, wait a minute, i got to go back. But it's better for you if I do anyway because there's one coming after me that he'll dwell in you. And thanks be to God, he sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And we can know the love of God. We can know the touch of God today. Stand with me if you would.